We are honored to have today for the key lecture uh, uh, Professor Atsushi Seiko. He's president of Keio University and by the way, he's also leading the commission, National Commission in Japan for their review, I don't know if that's the exact title, for the review of social security uh, and uh, he will have to do issues of pensions, health, everything that we have, long-term care, everything that we have been talking about. So, Professor Seiko, I, without any delay, I'll give you the microphone. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Crane, for your kind introduction. It is my great pleasure and honor to be able to speak on the problem of population aging before my distinguished colleagues. It is also great to see my old friends like Jim Smith, John Campbell. <laughs> it is an unexpected reunion of my old friends. So I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the co-organizers of the conference, namely the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology's Institute for Emerging Market Studies and the World Bank for providing me such an opportunity. As I am sure that you all are aware, population aging is an issue that all Asian countries must face. In the countries and regions of East Asia, such as Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, and of course here, Hong Kong, Population aging is already progressing at a rapid pace. Moreover, while the countries of Southeast Asia still have a relatively young populations, they are predicted to experience aging at some point in the future. Of all these countries, Japan was the first to be affected by population aging and the problems that accompany it are becoming increasingly more apparent. The experience of Japan will provide variable policy implications for other countries and regions of at first East Asia that began to experience population aging slightly after Japan. These will in turn become good references for the other Asian countries that will experience aging sooner or later, and furthermore for other countries outside Asia. This morning, I would like to discuss the issue that Japan is facing as a result of aging population and what is done uh, to uh, solve them. Please look at uh, uh, your handout. Do everybody have uh, the handout today? As you can see in figure one, Japan's population aging is globally unprecedented, both in its level and its speed. As for level, the proportion of older people aged 65 years old and over is now one quarter of total population in Japan, making it already the largest proportion in the world. And this proportion is going to be one-third of the total population in 2035, when today's newborn babies become adults. As for the speed, in Japan it took only 24 years from 1970 to 1994 for this proportion to increase from 7% to 14%, while in European countries, it took between 50 to 100 years and more. So for example, Japan's aging has been two times faster than that of Germany and more than four times that of France. Japan's aging population also has a sort of uh, depth. By depth, I mean that within the older population itself, the proportion of very old people aged 75 years old and over is increasing, particularly rapidly. The proportion of very old people 
aged 65 years old and over will be 20% in 2035. This tremendously aging population has an enormous impact on the Japanese economy and society. As you can imagine, its most significant impact is on social security. As a result of this aging population, the total expenditure on social security was almost 110 trillion yen, which is almost equivalent to 1.1 trillion US dollars in the fiscal year of 2012, which is 22.8% of the GDP of Japan at that time. And roughly half of this amount is for public pensions, and one third of this amount is for medical care and long-term care. The other impact of an aging population is that we have a smaller workforce, and therefore the level of production will decrease unless there is a substantial improvement in the productivity per worker. It also leads to lower earnings from work and therefore decreasing consumption unless there is a substantial increase in wage per worker. So in order to cope with an aging population, we should take every possible measures. One is of course to stop or at least moderate population aging. As I will discuss a little later, we should take adequate measures to reverse the trend of the decreasing fertility rate. However, even in the unlikely event that our fertility rate recovered drastically, newborn babies today would not be able to contribute to the Japanese economy until they are grown up, in other words, in 20 to 25 years' time. So we need to consider an aging population as a structural change under which we have to live for a while, say for at least two decades or a quarter of a century hereafter. In these circumstances, one potential solution is to promote the employment of older people. This means more older people continuing to work as an active generation to sustain our economy and society. And in order to make this possible, we should establish a society in which the will and ability of older people can be fully utilized. From here, I will refer to this as the lifelong active society. Of course, an aging population itself is the result of economic growth. And this is exactly the case with Japan. In Japan, as in other developed countries, two major driving forces of its aging population are closely related to the increase in per capita income. One is, of course, the increase in life expectancy. In 1947, immediately after World War II, Japan's life expectancy was just 50 years for males and 54 years for females. 65 years later, it has now reached 80 years for males and 86 years for females, as you can see in the figure two in your handout. And without a substantial improvement in living standards, which is only possible through economic growth, particularly rapid economic growth, you do not see such a drastic improvement in life expectancy. The other factor that creates an aging population is a decreasing fertility rate. Again, please look at your handout in figure three. The fertility rate of Japan, or Japanese women, was about 4.5 in the late 1940s, and this declined to the level of two in the 1960s and early 1970s. As you know, Fertility rate of two is the rate by which you can replace the same population of the current generation to that of the next generation. But as you can see in the figure three, 
it started to depart from the level of two in the mid-1970s and reached as low as around 1.4, actually 1.41 today. Though it recovered a little bit from its bottom of 1.26 that marked in 2006, this is still one of the lowest fatality rates even among developed countries. It is widely known that the contribution, excuse me, combination of rapid wage increases by economic growth and unchanged traditional division of work between men and women, as can be seen in Japan, Korea, and some southern European countries, usually creates an extremely low fertility rate. That is because women have to pay a higher opportunity cost for having babies under such conditions. By the way, if you look at uh, figure three, one interesting note on the trend of Japan's fatality rate is a sharp drop in 1966. You know what? That is because by Chinese way of counting years, 1966 was Hinoeuma, or a fire horse year. And there is a superstition, maybe this is a superstition of Japan, that girls born in that year will exploit their husbands. <laughs> so to try to avoid the possible risks for girls in the future marital market, parents refrained from having babies that year. Amazingly, this shows the incredibly significant impact of superstition on human behavior. Anyway, of course, we should make every effort to reverse the trend of the decreasing fertility rate, but the trend of aging cannot be reversed overnight. So to cope with such a tremendously aging population, it is extremely important for us to promote the employment of older people. If more older people with the will and ability continue working beyond the current retirement age, it will reduce the average per capita burden of the social security in the aging society. The increase in the number of active workers and consumers in their old age will also be driving forces of economic growth on the supply side as well as the demand side of the macro economy. That is the reason why I would like to emphasize the importance of creating a lifelong active society. Of course, you should not force older people to work against their will if they would like to retire. However, in this respect, Japan has an advantage. That is a strong motivation of older people to continue working. As you can see in table one on your handout, the labor force participation rate of Japanese older people in their 60s is significantly high in comparison with other developed countries. That means, according to the statistics, that the percentage of people who have the will to work in their 60s is very high in Japan, and this is very sort of fortunate uh, conditions for Japan. That's on one hand, even among major developed countries, Japan is facing a tremendously aging population. So, it desperately needs a lifelong active society. But on the other hand, it has extremely favorable conditions for promoting the lifelong active society too. We will be able to promote a lifelong active society by utilizing this relatively higher motivation among older people to continue working. In this I think the Japanese government has been basically consistent because the Japanese government has consistently promoted the employment of older people. As a result, the labor force participation rate of older people in Japan has become significantly high in comparison with the case of other developed countries, particularly in European countries, as we can see in Table 1. However, even in Japan, there are still some obstacles 
that have prevented us from promoting a lifelong active society, both in the social security system and in employment practices. One obstacle is in public pension system. Of course, it is quite natural that the pension benefit induces retirement because it is a benefit which is designed to make retirement possible. However, the current public pension system includes a very strong component which encourages pension eligible workers to retire or reduce their working hours. That is the public pension's so-called earnings test scheme by which a person's pension benefit should be reduced dependent on their earnings from work after they have reached the pension eligible age. So, pension eligible workers tend to restrict their earnings by reducing working hours so that they can avoid the pension benefit reduction as much as possible. Sometimes they retire completely so that they can receive the full pension benefit. Therefore, we need to revise the public pension system so as not to discourage older people from continuing working. My understanding is that the United States government and the United Kingdom government have already eliminated the earnings test scheme to prevent this possible negative impact on the labor supply and we should also consider such a revision. In the workplace, mandatory retirement practice are still dominant in Japan. According to a survey by Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, more than 90% of firms, employers with 30 or more employees now have a mandatory retirement practices. As you know, because mandatory retirement is a practice that requires severance simply because of the worker's age, it impacts in two ways on the utilization of an older workforce. One is that it reduces the motivation of older people to continue working. As is widely known, mandatory retirement from primary employers does not necessarily mean complete retirement from the workforce, and many older workers go on to so-called secondary job opportunities, usually with lower wages. However, major determinant of, excuse me, however, as repeatedly confirmed by empirical analysis, a mandatory retirement is also a major determinant of a complete retirement from the labor market. Researchers, myself included, have estimated the labor supply functions of older people and found that, roughly speaking, a mandatory retirement experiences reduces the probability of labor force participation in men aged 60 to 69 in Japan by about 20 percentage point, assuming other conditions are constant. The other negative impact of mandatory retirement is that it reduces the utilization of the potential abilities of older people. Again, according to our empirical study, as you can see in figure four, those who have experienced mandatory retirement have a statistically lower possibility of working in their 60s in the same occupation as they did at age 55. If we can assume that a worker's ability can be fully utilized when that person works in the same occupation for many years. This figure shows, and this figure means that workers subjected to mandatory retirement have a lower possibility of working in a workplace where their abilities are fully utilized. So we need to revise mandatory retirement practices by at least lifting the legal minimum age of mandatory retirement or by introducing an anti-age discrimination act like the United States. Of course, as you can imagine, if you really want to revise 
age-related employment practices like mandatory retirement. It is also necessary for you to devise the seniority-based wage and promotion systems too. If an employer lifts or increases the age of mandatory retirement with seniority-based wages unchanged, it will have many costly older workers and unnecessary numbers of manager or administrative uh, position uh, people. So I hope that employers and uh, workers or employers and unions uh, will start discussing revision of retirement practices and revision of the seniority-based wage system as soon as possible. Now, let me talk a little bit about another important thing for us to cope with an aging society. That is the social security reform. At first, one important thing for us to do with social security reform is to pay more social security benefits for younger people, particularly all kinds of benefits to assist child care. In the late 1970s, when the fertility rate in Japan started declining from the level of two, the Japanese government should have been concerned about the fact that the population would start declining in one generation's time. It finally started seriously thinking about it in 1990, when the fertility rate became as low as 1.57 which was lower than the lowest historically recorded rate, a rate of 1.58, which occurred in the year of uh, uh, fire force uh, in 1966, I mentioned earlier. So we call this the 1.57 shock. The 1.57 shock made Japanese people more conscious of the lower fertility rate and the Japanese government introduced the so-called Angel Plan, which was a package of policies to promote comprehensive child care support. But the measures could not be too aggressive because there had been virtually no measures to promote an increase in the fatality rate since the end of war. That is partly because of the stigma attached to policies for population expansion, which were linked to wartime population policies. Another unfortunate factor concerning the ANGEL plan was that unlike pension, medical care and long-term care, which have a guaranteed revenue under the social insurance system, child care has not had any permanent revenue sources. And unfortunately, in the past two decades, we have had a series of economic crises and uh, budget cuts, and that has prevented us from improving child care policy substantially. So the report of the National Council on Social Security Reform, which I chaired, recommended last summer that more social security resources should be paid for younger people including a substantial improvement of child care services. Reforms of public pension and medical care and long-term care are also extremely necessary. As I said earlier, the total expenditure on social security was almost 110 trillion yen in the fiscal year of 2012. You can see in this figure in the table two on your handout in more detail. When we think about the reforms of pension and medical and long-term care, at first, it is important for us to recognize the fact that the nature of the problems of public pension and medical care and long-term care are quite different. In other words, the problem with public pension is though, of course, this is difficult, but is a linear and rather a simple one. While on the other hand, the problem with medical care and long-term care are non-linears 
and much more complicated ones. As you can see in the table two on your handout, the expenditures on public pension benefit will increase at the same pace as increase in the number of pension eligible population, just increasing by 1.12 times in year 2025 compared to its level of the fiscal year of 2012. And the matter of public pension is also such a simple problem of money. So technically, we can reform the public pension system by simply changing the revenue and expenditure scheme. On the other hand, the expenditures on medical care and long-term care will increase even faster than the pace of increase in the, in the older population because it will increase with the increasing proportion of very old people aged 65 years old and over among older people combined with the increase in the quality and therefore the cost of medicine and care. So as you can see in the table two, uh, the expenditure on medical care will increase by 1.54 times and that on the long-term care will increase by 2.34 times respectively in 2025 comparing to their levels in 2012. And when you think about the reform of medical care and long-term care, it is not just a matter of money. You also have to pay much attention to service providers, medical doctors, nurses, or caretakers, and so on. So without their cooperation, it will not be possible to devise effective policies. In any event, social security payment is rapidly increasing. And as roughly speaking, as a 60% of it is paid by social security insurance payment, and the rest of it is basically paid by tax. And unfortunately, we do not have enough tax revenue to cover it at present. Mainly because of this increase in social security expenditure, the gap between total government expenditure and the revenue has been widening in the past decades. Now, the total amount of public debt in Japan is more than 1,000 trillion yen, which is more than double its GDP. So social security reform is deadly necessary. These reforms may face some political conflict, both from beneficiaries and the service providers. But we have to accomplish them. Otherwise, we will not be able to pass on to future generations our social security system, which allowed our country to achieve the world's number one longevity. The countries of East Asia are particularly now facing the same aging population problem. This means that we are sharing the same policy targets to cope with an aging population. And I think we can learn a lot from each other's experiences. And now, once again, I would like to emphasize the importance of creating a lifelong active society. If we are able to establish a lifelong active society, it will have valuable implications for all ASEAN countries which are facing the same aging problem. It will also be a good reference for other countries as well, because anyway, they will also face population aging sooner or later. The concept of a lifelong active society could and should be a global standard in an aging society, an aging era. I would like to see that in the future. And in order to make it possible, I think there will be a great deal of opportunities of joint research projects for ASEAN universities to collaborate with each other. In closing, let me quote Yukichi Fukuzawa, 
the founder of my university, Keio. Kuzawa urged that just as a guardian goose, you know, goose is a big bird with a long neck, guardian goose cranes its neck to watch for danger while the rest of the flock intently peck at their food. Scholars must calmly analyze the developments of the present and consider what needs to be done for the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank you. We can take two questions. For, um, very short, please, very focused. We are one and two. Uh, I was hoping you might elaborate on uh, what you describe as the strong motivation of older Japanese to work and whether, uh, what are the factors there seem to be a lot of factors that go against the labor force participation of older people, but yet it's quite high. And so has the government done anything? Have business done something? Or what's, what's the explanation? Can we go to the second question? Uh, it's a related question. Yeah. Okay. Can I, okay, so. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, to continue with the working population. So why is it that Japan is actually not promoting uh, migration from some of the younger countries, for example, Indonesia? to add to the workforce and eventually add to the tax revenues? Okay. Uh, let me reply to the first question. Uh, maybe there are a couple of reasons why Japan still maintain a relatively high labor force participation rate among older the people. Uh, one is, of course, it's a relative uh, matter, but uh, comparing to European countries, I think uh, uh, the level of pension benefit is slightly lower than uh, the, the, that of uh, European countries. So, uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, that made uh, uh, Japanese uh, older people uh, have a more uh, incentive to work longer. And of course, I don't like to, uh, you know, go into a sort of, a, let us say, a cultural <laughs> explanation or something like that. But maybe. Comparing uh, uh, to uh, uh, European countries, Japan also, like you know, the labor force participation rate of Korea is also high. So these East Asian countries still maintain some uh, work ethics, uh, working as uh, good for health or good for for yourself or something like that. That kind of mindset also affects. The other uh, thing uh, you can uh, explain the higher uh, labor force participation rate. Of, uh, of older people in Japan to some extent is a policy. As you know, in many European countries in 19, maybe late 1970s and 1980s, many European countries even encouraged older people to retire early to cope with the unemployment of young people. Uh, so some countries even uh, reduce the pension eligible age from 65 to 60. My understanding is uh, now uh, President Sarkozy of the French government tried to uh, re increase uh, the, the pension eligible age and he faced some uh, you know, uh, resistance from the labor union or something like that. Anyway, uh, the European, uh, unlike European government, uh, Japanese government has uh, consistently uh, promoted uh, the policies to, to promote the employment of older people. Uh, for example, uh, they provided some subsidies for uh, employers to employ older workers, or uh, they uh, revised uh, so-called uh, uh, Employment Stabilization Act for the elderly, uh, in which you know uh, the minimum uh, mandatory retirement uh, age uh, has been uh, lifted from uh, five, 55 to 60, then eventually 65 or something. So uh, I think uh, there will be both uh, uh, you know uh, uh, reasons in uh, uh, economic variables and uh, policy variables. Migration or uh, sort of. In taking uh, uh, foreign workers uh, is uh, one big uh, agenda uh, for uh, the Japanese politics. And uh, at first, my personal opinion is uh, under such a uh, drastic aging population, 
uh, we need to uh, seriously think about uh, uh, you know, uh, introduction of uh, uh, foreign workers or uh, immigrants from uh, Southeast Asia or other areas uh, of Asia. And uh, as a sort of uh, uh, first step of that, as you know, uh, the Japanese government recently uh, invite, invited uh, uh, you know, uh, Asian young people uh, to Japan uh, to be a, a sort of nurses or a caretakers or something. But the problem is uh, they invited uh, these young people to be uh, a nurses and uh, uh, caretakers. Uh, they also uh, forced us to, to pass a pretty you know, a difficult examination, <laughs> like you know, Japanese colleagues. So uh, I think uh, we need to have a, a more uh, sort of a, a realistic uh, uh, arrangement to introduce uh, uh, foreign workers uh, uh, to, to settle in the Japanese workplace. And uh, one thing uh, I a little bit worry about is, of course, as you can imagine, uh, the people who have been, you know, uh, arguing uh, that we need more, uh, you know, uh, foreign worker uh, tend to be uh, uh, not so good employers who do not like to pay uh, higher wages for uh, uh, domestic workers. So, of course, you know, when we introduce uh, 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 foreign workers, we need to, for example, uh, set uh, minimum wage rules or you know, social security rules or labor standards uh, universally, regardless of domestic and international workers, of course. So, uh, uh, but anyway, I think uh, we need to do that. On the other hand, as far as uh, so-called talented people is concerned, I mean the professionals and uh, so on, uh, I don't think there will be any necessity for us to have any barriers or you know, restrictions. So uh, uh, we need to uh, relax the visa policy for uh, uh, professionals and so on. Did I make myself clear to you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll have time to dialogue with Professor Seiko later in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um,